So Rebecca uh, gets a degree from the um, wildlife biodiversity, and she been working in many different conservation projects. Uh, but she working in Thailand, and from 19 uh, 2001, she moved to the Bot Botswana, and she. That is the way she start meeting the cheater, and that's the way she start getting love with the cheater, and that is the way she starts rising to fight to save the cheater. So uh, we are really great to have the Zebeka here to say with you more about the what she doing with the cheater. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're here representing myself and Jane Horgan, my colleague, is joining me today uh, to talk to you about the work of cheetah conservation Botswana. Cheetahs are one of the most endangered large cats in Africa today. Throughout their range, farming communities view them as a threat to their livestock and their livelihoods. And retaliatory killings thre significantly threaten these declining populations. But there's an alternative. By utilizing effective methods of livestock and land management, coexistence is a possibility and conflict can be avoided. So myself and a fantastic team are working really hard in partnership with communities and the government to secure a brighter future for Botswana's cheetahs. And we hope we'll, you'll listen during the, the presentation and think about how you are, all might get involved in cheetah conservation. We're all part of the solution and we can all make a difference. <coughs> cheetahs have been declining substantially throughout their range over the last hundred years, over hundred years. Uh, in the 1900, in 1900 uh, the yellow is the range of cheetahs and it's estimated there are about 100,000 100, cheetahs throughout this range. Now, due to declining prey populations, uh, increasing poaching and utilization, hunting, and increasing human-wildlife conflict, their range has significantly decreased to the red areas. And we only have about eight to 10,000 cheetahs left in the world today. So that's a 90% reduction in their population in just over 100 years, 115 years. And the key populations in Africa today are in East Africa uh, and also in Botswana, and Namibia and Zimbabwe. Between Botswana and Namibia, we have about 50% of the world's, pop uh, world's cheetah populations. So they really have a, a, an incredibly, a credible responsibility to conserve these animals for Africa and for the rest of the world. And we're working in the beautiful country of Botswana, particularly this amazing Kalahari ecosystem, which covers two thirds of the country. We have some of the highest levels of biodiversity of all African uh, wildlife in, the wa in Africa today. Uh, highest pop some of the highest populations of li lions, cheetahs, leopards, wild dogs. You know, it really is a sort of Noah's Ark of African wildlife. And they have some fantastic conservation credentials. 21% of Botswana's land is dedicated to national parks and protected areas. The Botswana government is significantly invested in conserving their wildlife resource. And we have a low human population density. We only have 2.2 million people in a country the size of France or Texas. So there's some, a great opportunity um, and a of hope in Botswana to conserve these magnificent populations. But we have a lot of challenges as well. In the 19th, human carnivore conflict is the greatest threat to cheetahs and other carnivores in Botswana. In the 1970s, the European Union subsidized Botswana to expand its beef industry. Um, the Kalahari ecosystems used to be used traditionally by the Botswana people as seasonal grazing lands for their livestock. So when the rains came, they would go in, graze the Kalahari. When the rains went away, they would move their livestock out and the ecosystem had a chance to recover. Now, with deep borehole technolo technology, 
Uh, we, they've been sinking boreholes all over the Kalahari to bring up underground water. And now permanent settlements are throughout the region and human expansion into the area is now displacing many wildlife species. And carnivore conflict has been increasing um, at high rates over the last 50 years since this expansion of the cattle industry. It's not unusual for farmers to kill cheetahs and other carnivores, uh, believing that they're a threat to their livestock. And this is a great, great challenge. So the future of Botswana's cheetahs are, is in the hands of the farming community. The, uh, cheetahs don't do incredibly well in protected areas. With high numbers of lions and spotted hyenas, which are stronger carnivores, cheetahs exist in quite low densities in those areas. And we find about 90% of the cheetahs living outside of protected areas on the farmlands. And here they come into conflict with the people. So their future is really tied up in uh, good rural development and farmers utilizing effective methods and being responsible to protect their livestock. And so they're a fantastic flagship species for Kalahari conservation. You know, being a high level, um, high level carnivore, if we can conserve adequate populations of cheetahs, we know that the populations of their prey and the ecosystem itself are healthy and conserved. And they're an incredibly beautiful animal. They can really inspire hearts and minds um, throughout the world and even in Botswana. Many people don't know that they're an endangered species. And even by giving that information can make people think twice about killing them. So they can really um, ensure the conservation of important corridors between protected areas um, and positive rural development. This is, um, they usually have about three to five cubs, as we just saw in that slide. The mothers are incredible. The, the, the cubs will stay with the mother for up to two years, learning all of the essential skills they need to learn uh, to survive. Uh, this was one of the first cheetahs I ever saw in the wild. And he was a beautiful animal. He came up to the vehicle. He even put his paws up on the vehicle, and he looked into my eyes. And I thought, my goodness, you know, you're, you're not in a protected area. You're surrounded by cattle posts. You're surrounded by people who have, in general, a negative perception towards sharing the land with you. And it was one of the key moments that made me realize that I'm going to help save you and your brothers and sisters and make sure that you have a future. So this, the him and his brothers, they'll stay with their mum for a, about two years, and then they'll go off to form a sibling group. Uh, where they'll hone their hunting skills together and then the males and the females will separate and go their separate ways and the males will stay together for life in a what they call a male coalition and this gives them a lot of um, advantages in hunting they can hunt larger prey and in also protecting territories and it was one of these male coalitions that was my sort of aha moment in wanting to conserve cheetahs um, you know, and dedicate my life to cheetah conservation in Botswana. I always wanted to conserve wildlife. I was really concerned about what was going on in the world, and especially endangered species, and I was looking for an opportunity to make a difference. I went to Botswana, which was a country I always felt inspired to visit, and I worked at a reserve called Mokalodi, uh, running a wildlife rehabilitation center. And one of my jobs was looking after these two cheetah brothers. Their mother had been killed by a livestock farmer and they had been hand raised, so they were tame. And I would go into their enclosure every day and feed them and they would come and purr and we would lay down together and obviously I fell in love with them. And I thought, well, let's see what else is happening for cheetah conservation in Botswana. You know, I'd really, really love to get involved. And I was shocked and surprised that there was nothing going on. Farmers were regularly killing them, had negative perceptions towards living with them and nothing was happening to, to change this situation. So I thought, well, here's my chance. Let me try and set up a project. So now with a fantastic team, over the last 10 years, we've been working really, really hard to change the status quo and create a future for Botswana's cheetahs. And I would like to welcome my colleague, Jane Horgan, who's going to talk to you about our research program. She's been working with us since 2010 and does amazing work um, in the Western Kalahari. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Might need that. Great. 
Hello, everybody. Thanks, Rebecca. Where are we? To save cheetahs in Botswana, first we need to be able to know what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, the Kalahari ecosystem can be quite bushy in a lot of areas, so behavioral observations that are carried out in the beautiful grasslands of the Serengeti and the Masai Mara are difficult to carry out in Botswana. So we have to rely on a variety of other research methods to find out and unlock the secrets of what the Botswana cheetahs are really up to. So we use a variety of different techniques. Uh, we're very blessed in Botswana to have the gorgeous Kalahari sands that cover the land there, and they act like a blank canvas for the wildlife footprints. And we are able to utilize the incredible skills of the Kalahari sand bushmen. Now, these guys are incredible trackers. They will look at a footprint in the sand that just looks like a smudge to me. I can't tell what it even is. And they will look at it and they can tell not only what species it is, but they can tell us what sex the animal is. And in some cases, they can even differen differentiate between individual animals just by looking at their footprint. So by utilizing those skills, we are able to get some really valuable information about the distribution of these cheetahs, uh, about the population estimates, and we can use those estimates to look at population trends, so whether the, whether the populations are increasing or decreasing over time. <laughs> these guys are great fun to work with. I absolutely adore them. This is us in the Central Kalahari Game Reserve. We just found wild dog tracks, which was very exciting. We also utilize satellite collars to give us information about the movements of cheetahs. This is really important uh, data because most farmers actually believe that cheetahs aren't endangered. It's really hard for us to get our heads around, but if you have one farmer and he sees a cheetah on Monday, and then he talks to his, his, his neighbor who sees a cheetah on Tuesday, and then his neighbor across the road sees a cheetah on Thursday, and then they all talk together and they go, oh, gee, these cheetahs are just everywhere. But then we get the data from the collars, we realize that's actually the same cheetah that's just been moving over large areas. So to be able to get this data and to show these farmers the maps and show to them, you know, these cheetahs aren't just hanging out on your farm alone. They're roaming over areas of 10 to 15 different farms. You know, that information is incredibly valuable to them and helps them to understand how the cheetahs are behaving in their own backyards, which is very valuable. The satellite collars have also unlocked another great secret that um, cheetahs actually prefer to hang out in areas where there is their natural prey. So the farmers will always think that the cheetahs are just hanging out to eat their goats and their cows, but in fact, they prefer to hang out uh, in the, in the um, communal areas where there's more antelope and on the game farms. So that's also great information that we can get from these collars that we can give back to the farmers to help relieve that conflict. Now, because cheetahs are quite an elusive species, we can get a lot of great uh, data out of using motion-activated camera traps. And this is actually a photo of the first ever motion camera that I placed out on the farms in 2009. So I'm very proud. It's quite a beautiful photo. <laughs> and we can use these camera traps and put them up on fence lines. We can put them up on roads and even at water points. And we can get a lot of really interesting behavioral data and we can also estimate uh, population densities from this information as well. One way to really uh, use the cameras in a really effective way is to put them at cheetah marking trees. Now, cheetah marking trees, they're kind of like the Facebook of the cheetah world. <laughs> so what they do is any cheetah that's hanging around in the area will be drawn to these cheetah marking trees and they leave their scent marks at the trees to communicate with other cheetahs that are in the area. So you can imagine they go up and if they urinate, that's like updating their status. <laughs> if they scratch on it, maybe that's like poking someone. <laughs> and when they defecate or they poop on the tree, that's kind of like uploading a photo. You know, it has an awful lot of information that can, you know, it can tell the other cheetahs about their sex, about their reproductive status, about their health, their fitness, you know, a lot of really valuable information, which is really cool. Now, this tree is quite special. This was the first ever cheetah marking tree that we began monitoring uh, in 2008, and this is a very special cat. This is Charlie. 
Now, the story is a bit of a sad one to start off with, but I promise it has a happy ending. Um, this, the farmer that owned this farm was having a lot of conflict with Cheetah. He was afraid that the cheetahs were eating his livestock, and so he utilized the power of the cheetah marking tree in a negative way. He set traps at this marking tree, and he ended up catching 30 cheetahs at this tree in only two months. Now, I'm very sad to say that he killed most of those cheetahs. Um, a couple, he caught a couple of young ones, which he chained up on his front porch and kept for a while as pets. And then we heard what was going on, and we started working with him. Um, we translocated a few of the cheetahs that he caught there to safer areas, to the reserves. But then we finally managed to convince him that this wasn't an effective or a long-term solution to his problems. So what we did was we managed to convince him to remove the, the cage traps that were at the marking tree, and rather we put these camera traps up. And so at, at the time, it was some of the first camera traps we'd ever been using. So what we found was soon after they, he stopped trapping there, Charlie moved in. Now, Charlie, it's hard to tell. There's not much reference point here, but Charlie is a big, beautiful male, very, very healthy guy. And what Charlie managed to do was he held, he, he claimed that territory on that farm as his own. And what he managed to do was he kept all the other cheetahs out of that area. So he actually held that territory for four years. And in that time, we saw very few other cheetahs. You would see them, you know, you'd get like one photo on the camera trap of them and then never see them again. So clearly there were cheetahs just moving through the area, saw Charlie was there, didn't want to intrude, kept on going. And because Charlie wasn't a livestock killer, it actually completely relieved the conflict on the farm. And by using these photos to report back to the farmer, we were, ab we were able to reassure him that he wasn't overrun with Cheetah, it was just Charlie, he was taking care of business, and he didn't need to worry anymore. So they're an incredibly useful tool for us. Another thing that the marking trees are really helpful for is to collect scat. So you remember the videos that, you upload, that they upload onto the Facebook site? Well, we can actually collect those and we can find out what the cheetahs have been eating. This is really important because the farmers think that the cheetahs do nothing all day except eat livestock. And what we've actually been able to find from this prey analysis is that on average, cheetahs actually, are, livestock only makes up about 5% of a cheetah's diet. So when a farmer goes out and shoots a cheetah on his farm, the chances that that's actually a livestock killer is incredibly small. So by portraying that information to the farmers, we've been able to decrease the amount of indiscriminate killings that have happened on the farms, which is really great. Now, through all of these research techniques, and thanks to the unique and uh, individually identifiable spot patterns on cheetahs, we've been able to create really great histories for individual animals and individual groups. And I have a little clip here of possibly the most impressive coalition of cheetahs in the whole world. Oh, no. Is it going to work? Come on, technology. This is what happens when you get girls from the bush trying to be all technological. <laughs> Doesn't always work. But while they're trying to figure it out, I'll tell you a little bit about this coalition. We call this coalition the Ring Brothers. So it's Aragorn, Gimli, Bilbo, and Legolas. So I see there are a few geeks in the audience today. Excellent. So they're characters from the Lord of the Rings stories. And that was, that was a public vote on Facebook, so please don't blame me for those names. Um, so it's not going to work. It looks like that's okay. Here's a photo of the boys. They're absolutely beautiful. So what makes them so magnificent? Well, first, there's four of them, and very, it's very rare for us to see a coalition so large uh, in Botswana, so that was very impressive to start with. And then each of these boys is actually over 110 pounds. So for a cheetah, that is exceptionally large. So these guys make quite a formidable quartet. Now, we were lucky enough in July last year to catch these guys, and we put collars on three of them for a revolutionary research project that we conducted with the Royal Veterinary College of London. And these collars were amazing. They've unlocked incredible secrets about the hunting collaborations that cheetahs do, how they live in the bushy environments. And one thing that we managed to find out from these cats that was incredible 
was that these guys didn't stay together all the time. Every now and then, one of them would peel off by themselves for a few days or a week, and then somehow in this vast, vast ecosystem, they would find each other again. And I don't know how they do it, but it was just amazing to see that the bonds were that strong within these coalitions that they would find each other again and they'd stick together. It was really amazing. Now I have to point out, second from the left here, this cat here, this is Legolas. Now Legolas is an exceptional animal. I was lucky enough to be there the day that we caught these guys and this cat just blew my mind. He, he was the biggest cheetah that has ever been collared on record, 150 pounds. <laughs> so that's 15 pounds heavier than any other cheetah we had caught at CCB, and we've caught over and, and measured over 100 cheetahs in our history. So he was so big, he broke our cage trap. He broke our holding box. He even broke the scale when we tried to weigh him. <laughs> so he was just absolute, the most impressive animal I have ever seen in my entire life really, really exceptional animal. There's a close-up of Legolas, isn't he? Absolutely gorgeous. Now, it was a few weeks ago, I was working in the office, uh, and I got a phone call from uh, a couple of our field officers that had just gone out to check some camera traps uh, in the field, and they called me up and they said, Jane, we found, found a cheetah by the side of the highway. He's dead. I said, oh my God, has he been hit by a car? They said, no, he's been shot. We found the, we found the shotgun cartridge here by the road. He's got, he's got bullet wounds in his chest. He's, he's been shot. Jane, he's really big. I, 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 I'm looking at the spot patterns. I recognize the spots. I think it's Legolas. And she sent me the photos on WhatsApp and I checked them against our ID book and it was him. Now, the area where he was killed, uh, there were no livestock farms. It was the main highway going through the west of Botswana in between game farms. It was an area the cheetahs used quite often because they love hanging out on the game farms. So he was just moving back and forth there with his brothers. So we know it was an unprovoked attack. What we think is that someone was just driving past, they happened to have their shotgun in the car, and just for the fun of it, or just because they hated cheetahs, he decided that he would take a shot. So one of the most magnificent animals in the world died that day for, for no reason whatsoever. Now, Legolas's death came at a time when we'd really been making great progress with our community programs. You know, Rebecca will talk about our community programs in one minute, and they've been incredibly effective. The areas where we're doing those programs intensely, we've actually seen localized increases in, in cheetah numbers, which is great. So we know that they're working, it's fantastic. But what Legolas's death has really shown us is that we need to be doing more, and we need to be reaching more people with this message. So what we hope that we can get from you guys is your help. So with the extra support, we can expand our community programs so we're reaching more villages, more communities, reaching more people with this message of coexistence and conservation so that in the future, beautiful animals like Legolas will never get shot again. I think that demonstrates how important our community and education programs are. Uh, community outreach is fundamental what to what we do. We have a great team of local Botswana who travel around our core area in the Western Kalahari, teaching farmers, farming communities, how to live with cheetahs and other carnivores. There's key methods that you can utilize, effective kraal, effective enclosure designs, herding strategies, the use of livestock guarding dogs, having breeding seasons, so you only have young livestock at certain times of the year when you can manage them better during the rainy season when there's lots of wild prey around. Uh, donkeys as guardians for livestock as well. There's great techniques that can have been proven around Southern Africa to reduce losses. 
So farmers can call us, we do site visits. If people are having a problem with cheetahs and other carnivores, they can call us and we'll go directly to the farm and we'll help them to assess what animal they're actually maybe having a problem with and then what kinds of livestock management techniques and protection methods they can utilize to decrease their losses. We also do this through community workshops. The communities will call us to have, to have help with decreasing their conflict and we'll go to the community and we'll give them that training on how they can reduce conflict with cheetahs and other carnivores by utilizing those great methods. Um, we also have a fantastic training center and it's on a demonstration farm in the Western Kalahari. And here we have um, that great uh, center there and we also have demonstrations of kraal designs, different kinds of rangeland management techniques, uh, livestock guarding dogs and, and other methods that we can have practical demonstrations of how to do it. We have a beautiful herd of goats um, looked after by our livestock guarding dogs and we train people how to do it. And our demonstration farm, as well as being a place for training, has been a place, a place for training for farmers, has become a place for the training of livestock guarding dogs. We bring puppies from communities, unwanted puppies, um, and also from, pup from shelters as well. And we bring them at six to eight weeks to our herd and they learn from our livestock guarding dogs how to do it. And then those, um, th actually, these are some of our new recruits. These guys came in just a few weeks ago and they're learning how to be livestock guarding dogs and they'll be placed out with farmers having conflict in the Western Kalahari. So we're able to give you know, these unwanted puppies uh, the chance of a, a brighter future as well. So based on levels of conflict and need, we'll select farmers um, to have these dogs. Uh, this little brown dog here was named Sweetie by his, by his owners. Um, we go back and we monitor the dogs regularly. Every two months we go back and we make sure the dogs are being well looked after and are in healthy conditions. And we help the farmers to remedy any behaviors um, which might be challenging so that we can make sure that they grow up to be fantastic, effective livestock guardians for their herds. And Sweetie, when she was still a puppy, um, she didn't come home one night. And her owner thought, oh, well, that didn't work very well. She's run off to go play with some other dogs. And in the morning, she went out looking for Sweetie. And she found her, she found the dog with an injured goat. A goat, a young, young goat had got in a, got a leg caught in a hole and had injured itself. And Sweetie had stayed the whole entire night with that animal. And there was tracks of jackals all around the area. And Sweetie, still as a young dog, had managed to protect her herd. So really, really effective tool. And to help people to utilize livestock guarding dogs, we provide free vaccinations and free sterilizations as well um, for the farmers that we're working with. And this has been really, really effective to increase the use of this really incredible tool. And it's amazing that all this animosity between cats and dogs throughout history, as we know, now dogs are making it possible for cheetahs to live in the same environment as farmers without any conflict. And the farmers that have been utilizing the livestock guarding dogs, 85% of them have seen a reduction in their livestock losses to nearly zero. So we've been able to demonstrate how effective this is at reducing conflict and encouraging co and enabling coexistence. So we have a farmer's network. Um, we work with the farmers and we give them the opportunity to spread the word themselves. This farmer, uh, Ramadisa, he was having lots of problems with cheetahs, um, but he, yeah, he, he had killed a number of cheetahs on his farm and he called us to say, look, you know, this is ongoing, it's not improving, how can you help me? So we helped him to improve his kraal and to place a livestock guarding dog. And it was so effective that he started teaching his neighbors how to uh, utilize livestock guarding dogs and better, better methods of livestock management. So the word spreads, you know, if things are effective and things are working, the farmers spread it together. And we bring them all together, the farmers network once a year to share those success stories and the challenges as well. And engendering a feeling of pride in these incredible animals and biodiversity of Botswana is key. Uh, not a lot of environmental education happens in Botswana's schools. So we have a school program 
where we go into classrooms and we give out, uh, we do school talks and we give school kits of fantastic resources that are tied to the Botswana curriculum to, in, uh, to enable students to learn about carnivores and conservation. They can be in the classroom, the lessons, or out in the bush as well under a tree. And those schools, we build up, an, um, build up relationships with them and we invite them to our Western Kalahari farm uh, for a three-day learning experience um, in our bush camp environment. And this is a fantastic opportunity for them to experience wildlife um, and natural, the, the nature of their beautiful land. And a new initiative we started just recently, Coaching for Conservation, is an after-school program which uses sport to teach carnivore conservation. So it's a really fun, engaging way uh, for kids to get inspired about becoming conservationists in the future. And we do as much public awareness raising as we can. We go to cattle auctions, to agricultural events, um, with stalls and information, and farmers can come and talk to us about the different services that we can provide for them. We go on the radio regularly every three months, and farmers can call in and talk to us about the problems that they're having. Uh, so it's a really great way of raising awareness um, amongst the general public. And this has been great for all our community programs, education programs, has enabled us to develop really good relationships with the communities that we're working with. And one, one village that we had worked with, and we'd gone and done a training workshop for them, had one farmer was having problems and he had uh, killed the mother. And he was going to sell the two cubs to illegal traders across the border in South Africa. And the villagers got together and said, no, this is not the way forward. Uh, we're gonna take these cubs to Cheetah Conservation Botswana and we were able to rehabilitate them and release them back into the wild where we belong. And just a few weeks ago, uh, one of the neighboring farms, a game farm, they were doing game counts and they had a helicopter counting all of the game in the area and the farmer was in the helicopter. And he saw this cheetah and he was like, that's the one that's been killing my animals. And he aimed his rifle, he was just about to pull the shot, but the veterinarian that we've been working with um, was in the helicopter and she said, stop, this is not the way. She pushed the rifle down and she stopped killing, him, killing that cheetah. And she said, look, there's another alternative. We can call Cheetah Conservation Botswana and they'll relocate the cheetah to a safe haven where she can live out our li her life and contribute to the cheetah population. So it's really wonderful to have this positive feedback from the community and this growing partnership over time, which is really demonstrates to us you know, that uh, the work we're doing is, is making a great difference. So we just want to say a huge thank you to all of you, all of our supporters. You know, it really is cheetah conservation, wildlife conservation is a team effort. And all of the support we receive from you, both financially and also emotionally, you know, you encourage us to stay in the field. You know, sometimes it can be hard out there, you know, when you're talking to farmers who might be angry. And when we come over here, we get so much positive inspiration that we realize this is what we want to do for the rest of our lives. And we can create, by working together with the communities, with the government, and with people around the world, we can ensure that cheetahs um, will not become a thing of the past, but a success story for the future. So from all of us in the Cheetahs of Botswana, we thank you so very much.